Welcome to the four-part webinar series, The Alchemy of Modern Shamanic Initiation. This is part one of four, Healing and Harnessing the Crisis of the Modern Shamanic Call. My name is Andrew Camargo, and I'll be your professor for the session. The knowledge I'm going to share with you is a light in the darkness. It will give you courage, hope, and the power and knowledge to harness the positive potential of this crisis we are facing. So during the session, you are going to learn how to harness the emergence of the shamanic archetype as a redemptive, healing, empowering response to the global crisis we're facing. You're going to learn the three archetypal stages of initiation that all modern Western shamanic individuals pass through. And you're going to learn the four essential labors that every modern Western shamanic individual must work earnestly to accomplish. The session is designed with a mythical three-act structure. Act 1, Departure, the Crisis, the Call, and the Emergence of the Shamanic Archetype. Act 2, Initiation, the Three Stages of the Archetypal Shamanic Initiation. And Act 3, The Return, Healing and Harnessing the Crisis of the Modern Shamanic Call. Now this training is not for everyone. It is intended for serious seekers with a serious purpose for being here, a lot of courage to dive deep in search of truth and wisdom, and the capacity to receive a big influx of shamanic knowledge in a single session. Think of this training session as an alchemical vessel. I use the metaphor of alchemy a lot. Within this vessel, we are going to receive, you are going to receive very important knowledge and guidance. Important if this is the sort of thing you're looking for. But if you try to multitask, or if you allow yourself to be distracted, you'll break the seal. And the special illuminating power of the knowledge will leak out. So please, I ask you now, and I recommend, if you sincerely want to get the gold out of this session, turn off the notifications on your phone. The phone is a big, leaky vessel. Consider turning your phone off entirely. Please close other windows on your computer. Please log out of Facebook. Hang a do not disturb sign on your digital door. This is serious. This is serious knowledge we're talking about for serious times. And if you want to receive it, it's necessary to focus. And form a strong intention for this session. These next few hours are devoted to sacred soul work. They are devoted to illuminating profound mysteries of modern shamanism, alchemy, and initiation science. Your healing, spiritual evolution, and the manifestation of your higher self, and the realization of your higher purpose and your highest aspirations. Act 1. Departure. The crisis, the call, and the emergence of the shamanic archetype. To begin, I would like to make a proposal. Shamanism is universal. It is an archetype. The shamanic archetype. The shamanic archetype is inherent in the collective unconscious of humanity. It emerges in all cultures and all periods of history, but it goes by different names and manifests in somewhat different forms, with somewhat different specializations. However, the basic archetypal complex is recognizable and consistent across all cultures. And this archetypal complex always emerges regardless of the conditions, but it emerges particularly powerfully in response to crisis. It's triggered through crisis. It's activated through crisis. Crisis triggers the emergence of the shamanic archetype. And as it emerges, it guides through crisis, to a new life on the other side. This new life is the life of a shamanic individual. A shamanic individual is a messenger, a medium, a mediator, a mediator between this world, the material world, and the other world, the immaterial world, or the super material world, otherwise known as the spiritual world. A shamanic individual is a representative, a representative of the spiritual world to the culture and a representative of the culture to the spiritual world, a mediator. Straddling the space between realms. Now the call to become a shamanic individual, and it comes as a call, it comes in a particularly brutal way, typically, through severe crisis, severe illness, severe trauma through the death and dismemberment of your ego, of your sense of self, and even death and dismemberment of your physical body. Some people are called to be a shamanic individual through near-death experience. And the process of being transformed into a shamanic individual is also a severe and mysterious experience. This process is called initiation. 
Initiation is a sacred process of spiritual transformation, of death and rebirth, where you are reshaped, reforged into a conscious instrument of spiritual forces. And we're going to dive into this mysterious process now. This webinar is a crash course in the science of initiation, specifically for Westerners, specifically for Westerners in the 21st century. So first of all, it's necessary to know that initiation is a very difficult process to undergo, full of dangers and pitfalls. But it's necessary to be courageous because initiation reveals the greatest secrets of your existence, the secrets of eternal life, and I'm not exaggerating, the secrets of eternal life, the secrets of your higher purpose, and the secrets of your higher self. Through the initiation process, you discover and recover your divine spark, your true I am, the spiritual foundation of your eternal being, which guides you to your higher purpose. If you have this ultimate treasure awakened within you, you can face anything, and you can truly serve humanity during the serious trials that we are facing in 2022 and onward from here. But as I said, initiation is a dangerous process, and a lot can go wrong. That's why it's essential that you undergo this process with two things, elderhood and lineage. Elderhood and lineage bring you into contact with the science of initiation. If your initiation process is guided by an authentic science of initiation, it results in healing and a new life. But without the guidance of a science of initiation that comes from elderhood and lineage, you can suffer an initiatory miscarriage, which inflicts serious damage on your soul and can even harm those around you. But if you're receiving guidance from a trustworthy science of initiation, you can hope to heal your soul, go on to help others, and serve as a light bearer for your culture, even in the darkest of times. You can hope to develop into an effective shamanic individual. And that's the goal. That's what we're going to study here. That's what I'm going to teach you. And that's what you're here to learn. So the mediating work, remember, shamanic individuals are messengers and mediators. And the mediating work performed by shamanic individuals can take a number of forms. For example, healer, soul guide, artist, writer, poet, musician, medicine carrier, master of ceremonies, entheogenic ceremonialist, dream tender, myth maker, storyteller, sacred historian, wisdom keeper, herbalist, clairvoyant, energy worker, sacred activist, spiritual warrior, and many more. These are just to name a few. So understand that the shamanic archetype always emerges. And right now there is an unprecedented number of shamanic individuals in the process of awakening to their higher nature and higher calling. So I have this idea, I call it the one in 100 hypothesis. Remember, shamanism is archetypal. It naturally emerges in any culture in response to crisis. So if you take, so here's the one in 100 hypothesis. If you take a random sample of 100 humans and these 100 humans form an isolated community, at least one of those 100 will undergo a spontaneous shamanic awakening and serve the shamanic function in that group. And how they serve that function will depend on the needs of the group. So, for example, they would have intense dreams, premonitions, maybe they would fall mysteriously ill, hear voices of spirits, tap into ancestral wisdom, embark on visionary journeys into the spiritual realms, with the idea of returning, returning from these journeys with healing powers and special knowledge to help the group, and the knowledge would be tailored specifically to that group. The shamanic individuals are the medicine bearers for humanity. Their job is to bring back from the spiritual worlds whatever medicine the culture is needing at that time. So one in 100 humans, that would mean, and that's a conservative number, but even at one in 100, that would mean that there are approximately 78 million shamanic individuals in the world right now in the midst of a birthing process. Now that I would consider reason for hope. Remember, the emergence of the shamanic archetype is triggered by crisis, illness, trauma, soul loss, and death. And actually, the harsher the circumstances, the more forcefully it emerges because it arises as a healing compensation. It arises in response to the unique soul needs of the culture at that time. And today, at this time, there is an unprecedented number of people gripped by the shamanic impulse because today we are facing tremendous crisis at many levels of our existence. We are currently living through a global crisis and we should try to perceive it as a global call to a shamanistic initiation. 
So I could rephrase that as we are currently living through a pan-human crisis, and we should try to perceive it as a pan-human call to a shamanistic initiation. Ever since March of 2020, you have been obligated to undergo some sort of initiation. You have had no choice about this. So from March of 2020 to the present, obligatory initiation. The only choice you've had is what sort of initiation leading to what outcome for your soul. Have you embraced this obligatory initiation as an opportunity, an opportunity to dive deeper into your soul and awaken slumbering forces? Have you harnessed this pandemonia to wake up to the realities of sorcery all around you? Have you learned more discernment about truth and deception and manipulation of the psyche through the media? Did you take the blue pill path? So I'm just referencing, I apologize for the cliche, but the matrix gives us a very useful um, term here. So the blue pill, if you remember, is the decision to forget, you know, you've started to wake up, but you take the blue pill, you forget about it, and you go back into the matrix again, being further indoctrinated into the matrix. Or did you take the red pill path? Because in March 2020, we really got hit at the crossroads, and there was a decision, and people basically got divided into two paths, the blue pill path or the red pill path. So which path did you take? The red pill path would be courageously liberating yourself from the matrix. So that's not really a sincere question. Obviously, you took the red pill path because you're here now listening. So if you took the blue pill path, you wouldn't be here listening to me. The red pill path is the path of courageously going down the rabbit hole, further down the rabbit hole, in search of the truth, courageously in search of the truth, in search of the mysteries of your existence, courageously in search of the mysteries of your existence. You've chosen to be here right now. And with all the other things you could be doing right now, which means that seeking truth and wisdom is a priority to you, which means you are on the path of courageously seeking wisdom and truth during these dark times, specifically during these dark times, during these times of terrible sorcery and deception, during these times of crisis and spiritual awakening. And in the other parts of this four-part webinar series, we're going to dive more deeply into these times of terrible sorcery and deception And you are seeking the sort of truth and wisdom that can help you navigate these times, navigate them wisely. You are looking for a form of modern shamanic knowledge that can really help you right now. So, good news. I have what you're looking for, and I'm going to give it to you now. All I ask from you is your undivided attention, so you can receive it properly. And that's not a small request. These days, to keep your attention undivided is a big commitment, because our culture is surrounds us with distractions that by definition, divide our attention. Even if you have your phone open and you have a messaging app on your phone, you get a new message, you get a ringtone, it will divide your attention. So all I'm asking from you right now is to sustain and protect and preserve your undivided attention so that you can receive properly what I'm about to give you. So you've made it through 2020 and 2021, and the situation continues to get more ominous. So let's prepare, let's train. For 2022 and beyond. For 2022, you're back at the crossroads again. You need to make another choice. Because this rabbit hole goes much deeper, do you want to keep going? Do you want to take another, another red pill within this red pill path you're already on? Because this four-part webinar series is going to take you deep, deeper down the rabbit hole, and you need to take another red pill, so to speak. In this webinar, we are going to dive deep into the science of 21st century shamanic initiation. In part two, we're going to dive deep into shamanic shadow work that is required these days, that is actually essential these days. In part three, we're going to dive deep into the occult history of Western civilization and learn exactly how we got into this horrible situation in the first place. And then in part four, after all this deep diving, we're going to focus on practical solutions. We're going to focus on redemptive alchemy and initiatory work that we can do today in 2022, very practical work, to transmute our situation, to transmute our psyche toward healing, regeneration, and redemption. Because we are learning here about shamanic alchemy. And both shamans and alchemists are the masters of transmutation, of transmuting suffering into wisdom, illness into health, poison into panacea, evil into evolution, darkness into light, death into new life. In this webinar series, in addition to training you, we'll also give you comfort and a medicine for your feelings of isolation, even despair. 
because these times we're living in are really separating people. That is a theme of these times, separation. People who were once friends are not going to be friends anymore. People who were once your friends are turning on you, even persecuting you, and you find out that maybe they weren't as good of friends as you thought. Even families are being affected. Families are shifting. Marriages are shifting. Friendships are shifting. Employment status is shifting. Social and family and professional relationships are all being dismembered, to use the shamanic terminology, ripped apart limb by limb. This should show you how sophisticated is the black magic that we are dealing with. And as I said, in part two, and especially in part three, we dive deeper into this subject of black magic that we are facing today. So there is a sword passing through humanity, dividing people into basically two groups. And that is the very essence of crisis. I've said we are living through a crisis. Well, the very essence of crisis is separation. The word crisis originates from the Greek crisis. And that is defined as the decisive turning point in the progress of a disease. It was a medical term. It was used by doctors. It was a change, a moment of change, which indicates either the patient was going to recover or die. A real crossroads. This originates from crinine, to separate, decide, judge. Separate, decide, and judge. Which originates even further from Cree, from the Indo-European, to sieve. To sieve, a sieve. So this crisis is a sieve. Think of it as a sieve. And it's separating the coarse from the fine, the material from the spiritual, the truth from the illusion, the good from the evil. Those who will break free and those who will get ensnared. Those who will evolve and those who will get left behind. And how you end up will all depend on how you use your free will. What hard decisions will you make? What will you spend your precious time on? What sacrifices will you make? What will you give your precious attention to? What will be your top priorities? If you have limited resources, how will you use those resources? What are your top priorities? What matters most to you? How will you conduct yourself in 2022 and beyond? And if you've been dedicated to the shamanic path, the path of initiation for some time already, now is the time to get even more serious, more dedicated, more disciplined. Now is the time you've been preparing for. This is the time you've been born for. It's for this day that you incarnated. The dress rehearsal is over. It's time for the real show. It's time to present the fruits of all your preparations. It's time for another turn on the spiral of initiation. So you may have heard this already, but this idea of crisis as being a kind of conjunction of danger and opportunity, a crossroads. So in Chinese, the word for crisis is a compilation of the of one of the characters of danger and one of the characters of opportunity. So the word crisis has this element, it's both danger and opportunity, very much a crossroads, a crossroads where like you could die or you can have it start a new life or a part of you dies and a part of you passes through to a new life. So crisis is brings together danger and opportunity. And this crisis, while surrounded by danger and death, sorcery and tyranny, and I would add um, soul enslavement and brainwashing, is also opening new opportunities, new opportunities for freedom, new opportunities for, for initiation that you couldn't see, maybe couldn't see, and perhaps didn't have before. This is perhaps the greatest opportunity humanity has had in a long time to make a collective leap forward in its spiritual evolution. Crisis brings about initiation. <clears throat> Crisis brings about the emergence of the shamanic archetype. So not everybody is going to go through a positive initiation. Some people are going to get sucked into a negative initiation and fall into the opposite of you know healing, fall into the opposite of liberation. But some are going to be spurred on to have a breakthrough in their evolution. So take heart, have courage, and pay attention. You are receiving the help you need if you are open to receiving it, if you are looking for it, and know what to do with it when it arrives. And in fact, it's arriving right now in this very webinar series. So please pay extra attention to what I'm about to teach you. The Archetypal Initiation Process. You were born to be a shamanic individual. Yes, certainly. But you cannot manifest your destiny, your shamanic potential, without undergoing a sacred process called initiation. Initiation is precisely what transforms crisis into opportunity. Initiation is what transforms death into new life. Through initiation, your higher bodies are awakened and then healed and brought under your conscious control. 
When this happens, your higher bodies become the vehicles for all your shamanic work, whatever that shamanic work may be. And every individual has different, let's say, uh, shamanic specialization. Through initiation, you learn how to consciously work out of your higher bodies to accomplish specific tasks for your people, for your culture. Now, there are variations in the initiation process across cultures, but it always consists of the same three stages. This process has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Of course, your initiation is ongoing and never-ending. Life consists of round after round of initiations. Some of you may be embarking on an early round, and some veterans will be embarking on yet another round. I mean, seriously, did you really think that there was an end to this process? Regardless of how far you come, the archetypal journey of initiation always has the same three-act structure. Act 1, departure. Crisis, breakdown, call, and separation. Act 2, the initiation proper. Descent, death, rebirth, and training. And Act 3, return. Ascent and entrance into shamanic service. And this three-act structure may seem familiar to you. I'm using this exact same three-act structure to structure this webinar you're watching. Now, let's dive deeper into these three stages. We are now moving to Act 2 of the webinar. Act 2, Initiation. The three stages of the archetypal shamanic initiation. So, we're, we're kind of working in a fractal here. Uh, we're, the webinar itself is, a, is structured according to these three acts. And we've just finished the first act of the webinar, and we're going into the Act 2 of the webinar. And in Act 2 of the webinar, we're going to look at these three acts of the initiation process. So Act 1, Departure, Crisis, Breakdown, Call, Separation. Act 2, Initiation Proper, Descent, Death, Rebirth, Training. And Act 3, the Return, Ascent, and Entrance into Shamanic Service. So Act 1, The Departure. Why is the emergence of the shamanic archetype triggered by crisis and illness? To understand that, let's look at the anatomy of the psyche. Let's look at the soul science of the psyche. First of all, you have an ego. The ego literally means the I am. It doesn't mean you're cocky and arrogant necessarily. It just, the ego literally means the I am. So you have an I am. And it is the extent of your self-awareness as a unique individual. The extent of your self-awareness. And it has limits. So in this picture here, imagine this, this figure in the center with the arms outstretched. That represents the I am. Now, your ego is not inherently bad. Quite the opposite. It's potentially your greatest treasure. But your ego needs a lot of work to become a treasure. It can certainly be foolish and frequently be foolish, ignorant, lost in illusion, even corrupt. But it can also be loving, compassionate, wise, illuminated by higher truth and spiritual wisdom. So the goal of personal development and the goal of alchemy is to transform your ego from the seat of illusion to the seat of your higher self. So your ego is contained or embedded within a higher body. Let's just call it your soul. Later on, we'll see how your higher body is actually, or your soul is actually a higher body. So in the 20th century, the soul came to be called the psyche, thanks to psychoanalysis and thanks to psychology. Your soul came to be called the psyche. So psychology is the study of the soul. So your soul or psyche is partially conscious and partially, and to, for most people, largely unconscious. The soul, in its full extent, including the parts that you're unconscious of, contains a whole universe within it. It is the microcosm of the universe. So you've heard of as above, so below. That's because of this nature of the soul being a microcosmic reflection of the cosmos. And that is the basis of astrology and also alchemy. So in astrology, there is a magical correspondence between the cosmic bodies and the human soul. Now, in the more personal regions of your soul, the area closer to your ego, the area that you're more conscious of, you have your desires, your sufferings, your dreams, at least the dreams that you remember. When you can remember a dream, it is it shows that you that your ego is interlap is overlapping with your soul because you can only remember and be aware of things that your ego, where your ego is. So where there is memory, there's ego presence. So the dreams that you remember. 
your traumas that you remember, that you haven't repressed. If you don't remember your traumas, it means that your ego has not integrated your traumas or transformed your traumas. Your neuroses, at least that you're aware of, your complexes that you're aware of, and your inspirations that you're able to consciously tap into. This personal region of your soul is partially conscious and partially unconscious. And this is the territory that you work on with psychotherapy. You become, you you know, remember your dreams better. You become more aware of your desires. Your, your unconscious desires become conscious. You become, you remember uh, repressed traumas. You become aware of neuroses and complexes within yourself. You tap into deeper inspiration within yourself. You are essentially enlarging the sphere of your ego to encapsulate more of your personal soul. However, the soul is very deep and you have transpersonal regions of the soul. And in these transpersonal regions of the soul, you have what Carl Jung called the archetypes of the collective unconscious. And these are, as I teach in my school, the building blocks of your higher self. These are the raw materials that you work with alchemically and initiatically to actually build your higher self. And in these transpersonal regions of your soul, you have my favorite archetype, the shamanic archetype. And with it, all manner of latent magical and spiritual powers. So the shamanic impulse lives in the collective unconscious of humanity. It is found in the transpersonal region of the soul. But most people can't access it. Most people are, not, are have a very limited consciousness of even the personal regions of their soul, of their unconscious desires, of repressed things, of, you know, like people have a real limit to how much of their personal soul that they're aware of. Uh, and so all the more so with the transpersonal regions of the soul. And most people cannot access these regions, these magical regions, these mysterious depths, because there is what I like to call an ego soul barrier, or you can call it an ego unconscious barrier. And this sets the limits of your consciousness and self-awareness. This creates a division between your conscious and your unconscious. And this is the area that you work on in psychotherapy. And this is also the area that you work on, that art works on. This is also the area that sorcery works on. And this is the area that shamanism works on. So ego soul barrier or ego unconscious barrier. The ego soul barrier can also be thought of as a physical body, higher body barrier. This is a barrier between materialism and a more shamanic clairvoyance of the higher bodies. So in this case, the ego is still stuck in the illusion of materialism. It thinks all there is is the physical body. It is not conscious of itself beyond the physical body. But we are much more than our physical bodies, as the shamans know and as the alchemists know. So... In this case, with the, the sort of physical body, higher body barrier, the ego is not conscious of the higher bodies that it is embedded within. So why does crisis trigger a shamanic awakening? Because crisis breaks down the ego soul barrier. Crisis breaks down the ego unconscious barrier. And crisis also, especially like near death experience or a physical crisis, breaks down the physical body, higher body barrier. When somebody has a near death experience and they actually quote, physically die, and yet their consciousness goes on, the, the barrier between materialism and a more shamanistic consciousness is opened. Is, you know, the barrier is broken down and the consciousness is opened. So the effect of crisis is to attenuate and break down this ego soul or ego unconscious barrier. Whittles it down, whittles it down, and then there's a popping. The consciousness expands, oftentimes very rapidly, so this, this, this ego soul barrier, ego unconscious barrier, it gets whittled down through various forms of crisis, such as existential crisis, depression, personal tragedy, illness, trauma, assault of sorcery. This is pertinent for today. Extended quarantine, also pertinent for today. Loss of job, loss of security. The rug just, you know, gets pulled out from under your feet. Disillusionment, near death experience, especially psychedelic experience. Definitely. In all cases, the ego soul barrier breaks down. And then the higher bodies start to awaken. So the ego suddenly finds itself swimming in the mysterious and vast and deep waters of the soul and starts to become conscious of profound depths that were previously unconscious. The ego, the light of I am awareness, descends into the soul and animates what it encounters. What you look at, you animate. What was sleeping, when looked at, awakens. Imagine you're going into the basement with a flashlight. That's a good way to think about it. You're going into the dark basement with a flashlight. And you shine a flashlight into the darkness and this brings a torch of ego awareness into the unconscious areas. And when this happens, the depths of the soul stir and unfold. What happens if you have a, a rat infested basement and you go down there with a flashlight? Suddenly the rats scatter and you see what's down there. You see all the spiders and rats and snakes and scorpions and, and, and zombies and, <laughs> and what have you, whatever's down there. 
And the dead, let's just say the dead rise from the grave and the sleeper awakens and the sleeping parts of the sleeper awaken. So this is an alchemical mandala, which I like, and it shows, you know, the I am kind of emerging from the unconscious core and then illuminating what is there. And so this final mandala is really like an image of a, of a highly initiated shamanic individual working very much as a mediator between the spiritual world and the material world. So when the ego consciously experiences the depths of the soul, the shamanic archetype begins to awaken. And also, all the shadows start to stir. It's not just an easy process of light and suddenly all these, these angels and divine beings start speaking to you. No, no, that's not how the shamanic, at least unless you're doing a bypass, that's not how the shamanic process unfolds. All the shadows start to stir initially and all the previously suppressed psychological complexes really come out. The unconscious depths come to the surface, often very suddenly and often with overwhelming power. Now, if this revelation of the shadows is not proactively and very wisely and courageously tended, it will happen, it can happen in the most destructive way, potentially leading to the opposite of healing. And this is taking place, not just, you know, perhaps in your life, but this is taking place everywhere in the world right now because we're looking at a macrocosmic shamanic initiation. So everything that happens in the individual case is happening in the macrocosmic case. That's why we need to understand how it happens in the individual case so we can have wisdom about how it's happening in the bigger picture. So those initiated into the mysteries of shamanism, but who choose or who have chosen to use this knowledge for evil, for power, for personal gain, they know how to engage in sorcery with these revelations of unconscious shadows. They know how to exploit it and harness these shadows towards a desired end. They are technicians of shadow. So pay attention. Psychological content that the ego has been repressing for years, even for lifetimes, starts to surge up and threatens to swallow the ego. A sudden eruption of unhealed repressed traumas, destructive, untransmuted emotional energy, untrained, uncontrolled shamanic clairvoyant powers, untrained, unrefined spiritual perception, dark, repressed sexual energy, and more. It's a difficult period. It can be extremely chaotic and overwhelming. And you're lucky if you don't end up in a psychiatric hospital, actually, so in this stage of the process, you are vulnerable in many ways. Vulnerable to mania and depression, vulner and major mood swings, vulnerable even as far as psychosis, vulnerable even to possession, vulnerable to uncontrollable mediumship, which is related to possession and psychosis and mood swings, vulnerable to sorcery and seduction, both being seduced and also becoming a seducer, vulnerable to charlatanism, both being like preyed upon by a charlatan and also becoming a charlatan, vulnerable to, and that's related to uh, delusions of grandeur. But really, and really most seriously, one is vulnerable, especially in 2022, especially vulnerable to being manipulated by black magic. So those with ears to hear, listen well. Elderhood and lineage are particularly important during this period because a lot can go wrong and the damage that happens here can be very difficult to rectify later on. Just think of uh, a human baby. You know, when we're going through initiation, we're giving birth to our shamanic self, we're giving birth to our higher self. And at the beginning of the initiation process, it is an infant. So just think about an infant. If an infant suffers, uh, is dropped on the ground, or if an infant suffers malnourishment in the early stages of life, it, it can be very seriously damaged for the rest of its life. So the damage that happens in the earlier stages can be very difficult to rectify later on. It's the same with infants as it is with individuals on the shamanic initiatory path. So the key to traversing this difficult early stage is to connect to a trustworthy science of initiation that can help you navigate the stormy sea and to find an initiating elder who can guide you through the process. So this is what happens with the arrival of the crisis, the arrival of the shamanic call. But how does one actually answer the call? Let's say you're up for it. You say, yes, I want to do it. Now what? Well, the affirmative response to the call is to depart from your ordinary world. Sacrifices are necessary. The initiation really begins with a departure, a separation from the tribe. Because this is a solitary journey, even today. I mean, in traditional shamanism, the, the shamanic candidate would literally leave the tribe and go into isolation. But that's not really tenable in the modern situation. If you're living in a city, if you have a job, if you have a family, but you're still getting a shamanic call, you can't just go leave your family, leave your job. But there is a subtle form of uh, sacrifice. There's a subtle form of going into solitude that can take place. 
Because this still remains a solitary journey. The initiation journey is fundamentally solitary journey. To enter the spiritual world, you must leave the social world behind, at least to a certain extent. Your connections to the consensus reality of your culture must somehow be broken down, and you must undergo a direct experience of the mysterious depths of the soul and the, mis and the mysteries of the spiritual world. And if you're wired into media, if you're wired into movies and TV shows and television and YouTube and internet and social media, this is taking the place of your direct experience of the spiritual world. So there's a certain amount of, of, of renouncing of these things that's necessary in order to really dive into the mysteries of the spiritual world that begin by diving into your own soul. So crisis separates the individual. Crisis isolates the individual. Now separated, now isolated, you can proceed to the initiation itself, the initiation proper. So here are three stages, and we are now in act the act two of the process. We're in act two of the webinar, and in act two of the webinar, we're in act two of the three-act process. The descent, death, rebirth, and training. So alchemy, this is an alchemical image. Alchemy has, as we'll dive into more in part two of this four-part webinar series, we'll get into the mysteries of alchemy, how it relates to shadow work, how it relates to the descent to the underworld, how it relates to shamanic initiation. Here you have Hermes, the archetypal shaman, the archetypal guide of shadow work going into the underworld. And here you have the motif of caves, caves leading down into the depths of the earth, into the darkness of the soul, the shadows of the soul. So the second stage of the archetypal shamanic initiation is a descent into the depths of the earth, into the underworld, into the shadows of one's own soul, into the unconscious. So we're going to go deeply into this in part two. In fact, part two is an extended study of the descent into the underworld, and we're even going to study the guide of this descent and learn how to work shamanically and alchemically with this guide of the descent. So for now, though, we're just doing kind of a survey of the, of the process. So why a descent? Can you just bypass the descent and go up to the higher realms right away? Why, why go down there? It's dark down there. It's scary down there. Why can't we just go up right away? Well, first of all, there is no bypassing the descent. Initiation requires a voluntary submission to some sort of death. So the first step is a descent to the tomb. And this I get into, especially in part two, a lot about how it's actually impossible to buy. What well, we're talking about a descent to the underworld is synonymous with shadow work. And you cannot bypass shadow work. That's, that's one of the main themes of part two. You cannot bypass shadow work. And if you try, um, it will have very unfortunate, almost tragic results. So it's impossible to bypass. So now we're speaking of it in terms of the shamanic descent, the so descent to the tomb. In the initiation process, your higher bodies, just very practically speaking, in order to awaken, there needs to be some sort of separation from your physical body because at first, your higher bodies are all tied up in materialism, all tied up in the illusions of your ego, and even there's like filaments that are all tied up in your physical body. So your soul and spirit, which, are, which have their home in your higher bodies, Although they also have your home in your physical body too. That's kind of the point of your physical body. But they come from the divine and they will return to the divine when your body is in the ground. Food for worms. Your body comes from the earth and it must return to the earth. It is a divine vehicle still. The physical body is divine. It's divinely created and it's a home for your spirit and soul. But it's temporary and will return to the earth. So initiation liberates your soul and spirit from the prison of your physical body so your higher bodies can, let's say, unfold their wings and become instruments for shamanic work, go through the training process. In order for this to happen, you need to surrender your body to the earth so that your soul and spirit can be set free. But there's another reason why the descent is necessary. You have to descend into the unconscious depths of your soul. This is where really shamanic initiation really begins, is descending into the shadows of your unconscious and this, as we cover in great depth in part two, in the next part of the series, The Science of Shamanic Shadow Work, your unconscious soul is where your karma is stored. And there are great mysteries stored in your unconscious. And any shamanic individual cannot bypass this. Quite the opposite. They have to dive into it. They have to descend deeper into the personal karma. So initiation is the process where the higher bodies become awakened, healed, brought under conscious control, transformed into effective shamanic tools, vehicles. But prior to initiation, the higher bodies are largely asleep, unawakened, wounded, fragmented, locked up in the basement, attached to illness or darkness, or even indoctrinated by sorcery programs in the media. In general, 
messed up and out of control or even you know pertinent today controlled by nefarious forces so we all have our individual karmas and we all have suffered greatly all have suffered greatly in one way or another in past lives and in this life this past life karma has played itself out in our present incarnation this is important to understand our past life karma has played itself out and is playing itself out in our present incarnation in our seemingly unjust sufferings and blows of fate and all these sufferings from the past and those incurred also in this lifetime are all stored there in the unfathomable depths of the higher bodies. This is an essential thing to understand in the science of shamanic initiation. Our karma is stored in our higher bodies, hiding in the unconscious, guiding and influencing our ego without our ego necessarily even realizing it and, and almost always not realizing it. It's very hard to perceive how your own higher self, how your own karma has guided you to your hardships in order to work out your karma, transform it, and eventually redeem it. As difficult as, as this may be to comprehend, there, are sub, there is sublime wisdom in the way this unfolds because the transformation and redemption of your past life karma is the true meaning of the salvation of your soul. Salvation is when you have transformed your karma. In the past, we've all been cruelly persecuted and perhaps we've also cruelly persecuted others. We've been killed and perhaps we've also killed and we've also made serious mistakes on our own. Perhaps we've somehow betrayed ourselves or our highest values. Perhaps we've also betrayed others. People have wronged us and now we owe, they owe us a debt. And we've wronged others and now we owe them a debt. And we've also wronged our own higher self and now we owe our own higher self a debt. And all this comes back to us in this lifetime to haunt us. And to haunt us you know, it seems like it haunts us if we take a certain attitude towards it, if we don't face it, if we try to run from it. If we try to run from it, it chases us. And this I also get into a lot in part two about how shadow work bypass is basically trying to run from your karma. And if you try to do that, it chases you, it haunts you, and it becomes almost like a tormenting devil demanding that we pay our debts and being cruel to us when we try to avoid paying our debts. But there is cosmic wisdom in this. There is cosmic justice in this. This is all towards the end of our spiritual evolution, our salvation, so that we can be even with the great cosmic accounting book. This really is how it works. But there are some out there who very well understand how this works and use this knowledge in very dark ways to achieve the exact opposite of healing. Understand, unhealed trauma can be triggered in the first place, and then harnessed to control individuals, groups, even entire nations. This is getting into the science of black magic and sorcery. So those with ears to hear, listen well. So the traumas in past lifetimes, imagine they magnetize you without you realizing it. They unconsciously magnetize you to a recapitulation of traumas in this lifetime. But, and here's the thing, with a built-in redemption potential. You're not just going on this hamster wheel of trauma, going around and around in the same traumas. Each time when you're unconsciously magnetized to a recapitulation of trauma, there is a new opportunity, a new opportunity for redemptive alchemy. There is a built-in redemption potential, always with the potential to transmute. This is where the mysteries of alchemy come in. The potential to transmute the traumas into healing, knowledge, wisdom, compassion, love, forgiveness, into a new story. All this difficult karma is stored in the unconscious regions of your higher bodies. But also this redemption, redemptive potential is found there too. And this we get into in depth in part two, the science of shamanic shadow work, where we talk about the guiding spirit of shadow work as the messenger of karma and how shadow work is inseparable from alchemy and, and how alchemy is inseparable from shamanism. So this difficult karma is stored in your Unconscious regions of your higher bodies, also the redemptive potential is found there too. It is found in the shamanic archetype, which transmutes death into new life and illness into healing. And these mysteries start to unfold. These alchemical mysteries start to unfold when the shamanic archetype starts to awaken in you. And all the more so when you start to midwife this awakening process and you consciously work on this awakening process, you radically accelerate these mysteries. So shamanic initiation is a precious opportunity to alchemically transmute trauma, suffering, and injustice into healing, life, and redemption. But to accomplish this, you must first descend into your personal past, into the depths of your soul, where your karma and your wounds are stored. And this, my friends, is shadow work. And to do this, you need a guide. So if you want to learn more about the guide who, who, who helps you do this work, check out part two of this four-part series. 
So through your shamanic descent, you have an opportunity to transmute trauma into power, pain into comfort, ignorance into wisdom, fragmentation into union, injustice into redemption, death into new life. As you engage in your initiatory process, a narrative unfolds that has magical redemptive power. Your original traumas become the catalysts for your healing journey. Your original wounds become the inspiration and personal power to help many others. However, and I keep coming back to this because it's 2022 and we need to understand this. These same principles can be used in an inverted way, which is the basis of black magic. The traumas stored in the higher bodies can be manipulated and harnessed, triggered and harnessed, using an evil inversion of this initiation science I'm teaching you in order to bring about the opposite of a redemptive narrative. What's the opposite of a redemptive narrative, a tragic narrative? Again, I say, those with ears to hear, listen well. So what begins with descending into our personal karma, it naturally goes into the, the further stages of descending deeper into your ancestral karma. The barrier between your personal karma and your ancestral karma is not clear. They're tied up with each other. One leads directly. The personal karma leads into the ancestral karma. So this descent to the underworld is a descent into your personal past in order to heal and accomplish soul retrieval and illumination of your personal shadows. But it is also a descent to the realm of the collective past, a descent into the realm of the ancestors. Ancestral trauma is also stored in the depths of your soul. And there is a central trauma at the heart of every Westerner, the severe persecution of the shamanic impulse throughout Western civilization which lasted for many centuries and was fully genocidal and unspeakably cruel. And this is what part three of this four-part webinar series is all about. We dive into that story to do a collective soul retrieval operation there. The shamanic archetype is universal. Every culture has its own expression of it. In Western civilization, our civilization, our shamanic lineage was called the Mysteries. The mysteries initiated, they were schools of initiation, and they initiated individuals into the spiritual world. Through the mysteries, individuals received the divine arts and sciences, alchemy, astrology, magic, science, mathematics, architecture, clairvoyance, secrets of healing, secrets of eternal life, sacred history, sacred geometry, the impulses, also really, in general, the impulses for the spiritual guidance of humanity. And then, 2,000 years ago, the Christ event took place. Now, this event had the potential to be a positive evolution of the mysteries. It had the potential to be actually a new mystery. But this new mystery was seized upon by the psychotic, anti-spiritual forces working through the Roman Empire. It was taken captive and exploited for the amassing of great power. This became the Church of Rome, or what I like to call churchianity, to distinguish it from Christianity churchianity. And if you're interested in this, you really have to check out part three of this webinar series because that is exactly what we study in depth in part three. So first, the Church of Rome removed the gnosis from its own founding mystery, the Christ mystery, creating a rigid, hollow, what I call evil clone version of Christianity with the almost with the, the soul of it removed. Then the Church of Rome systematically over centuries eliminated the mystery wisdom all throughout Europe, North Africa, Asia Minor, the Middle East, persecuting the shamanic impulse everywhere and obliterating the mysteries and the mystery schools wherever possible. And it wasn't just paganism and ancient mystery traditions that were persecuted. The Church of Rome also persecuted the more Gnostic, mystical, shamanic approaches to the Christ mystery itself. You're saying, what do you mean shamanic, uh, shamanic approaches to the Christ mystery? Most people haven't even heard of shamanic approaches to the Christ mystery, and that's a testament to how successful churchianity was in exterminating it. So in other words, the Church of Rome, or churchianity, also persecuted Gnosticism and hermetic, esoteric Christianity. Over the past 1,600 years, the Church of Rome has suppressed the shamanic impulse and created a form of Christianity that regards the shamanic impulse as diabolical, that demonizes the mysteries of nature, that demonizes the goddess mysteries, that demonizes the mysteries of paganism, that demonizes cosmic mystery wisdom, that even demonizes the more esoteric shamanic approaches to the Christ mystery itself. And they have relentlessly persecuted the bearers of the shamanic impulse. And in the process, they have cut the chain of ancestral shamanic wisdom in Western civilization. This chain must be retrieved, restored, healed, and brought to life again. 
in the 21st century. And that is exactly what we will be doing in part three of this four-part series. Part three is called Retrieving and Restoring Western Civilization's Ancestral Shamanic Lineage. In part three, we will embark on a journey into our ancestral past to begin a very important soul retrieval of the persecuted shamanic lineage of the West so that we can bring it into the 21st century, heal it, and use it in a rectified form to guide our own initiatory journey. This is the first essential step to healing and redeeming our collective ancestral trauma, and we are going to do that in this very webinar series. So if this is something you want to participate in, watch part three, Retrieving and Restoring Western Civilization's Ancestral Shamanic Lineage. And we desperately need to do this ancestral healing work now. Because again, these shamanic principles can be used for good, but they can also be used for evil. And the ancestral traumas that we're carrying can be harnessed and directed towards evil ends. And boy, are they being harnessed and directed towards evil ends. So pay attention and work earnestly to heal. So this brings us to the crux of initiation, the death and the rebirth. This descent to the underworld culminates with a death and dismemberment of your lower ego. And out of this death, a new ego emerges. The goal is not to get rid of the ego. The goal is to alchemize the ego, is to initiate the ego. So out of this initiation, a higher ego emerges, an initiated ego, an ego that has been rebuilt from the dismembered limbs, but reanimated by something more, reanimated with a divine spark, the spiritual spark that comes from the divine creative word, the logos, the I am of God, the spiritual quintessence. So this is a picture of Alex Gray. I really like this picture. This is the dismemberment. This is a, depicted as a physical dismemberment, but this could also represent the dismemberment of your ego. And this is the resurrection. It has been remembered. It has been reassembled and uh, based upon the spiritual quintessence, the divine spark. Normally, your lower ego keeps your higher body suppressed, asleep, locked in the basement. Through this initiatory death, however, your lower ego is dismembered and your higher bodies are set free. And if your lower ego is, is, is slated to be dismembered and you're resisting it, it's all the more painful. But if you surrender to it, it's relatively painless or as painless as it can possibly be. And if you understand why you're doing it, it's towards shamanic initiation then you can really surrender to it all the more because it is necessary for your lower ego to be dismembered in order for your higher bodies to be set free. And when they're set free, they can begin to unfold and be illuminated by the divine forces of the spiritual world, by the light of spirit. And this is the beginning of your new life as a shamanic individual. When And when your higher bodies are freed and start to unfold, they in turn, here we get into some science of initiation, they in turn give birth to your higher ego your initiated ego, your twice-born ego. So your lower ego dies, your higher bodies emerge, and then out of your higher bodies, a new ego emerges. So it's like a cyclical process. One gives birth to the other. And this initiated ego or twice-born ego is an ego that is fundamentally rooted in spirit, fundamentally rooted in your higher self and is the actual throne where your higher self will descend upon and sit upon. This is an ego that is capable of shamanic work. This initiated ego is assembled from the archetypal building blocks of your higher bodies. And you yourself help this process move forward through your conscious alchemical efforts, through your commitment to doing this work. So once forged, your initiated ego, now rooted in spirit, becomes the new center of your consciousness and the new center of your personality. And is able to work consciously, consciously with the forces of your higher body. This is the essence of shamanic work. This is what shamanic individuals do. You have your higher bodies, but they are more like vehicles, vehicles for your initiated ego to use. Think of your higher bodies as a dragon. I like this metaphor of the dragon. Think of your higher bodies as a dragon uh, that allows you to perform all manner of shamanic work. Your initiated ego is who must learn to harness and ride this dragon. So to recap the cyclical process, your lower ego gets dismembered. Your unconscious higher bodies are then freed and awakened. And these higher bodies become the womb for the rebirth of your higher initiated ego. Your higher bodies provide the archetypal building blocks for the forging of this initiated ego. Once forged now, your initiated ego must now learn to harness the higher bodies that gave birth to it. It's like learning, it's like learning, it's like imagine you a dragon gave birth to you. And now you have to learn how to ride that dragon that gave birth to you. An initiated ego that can harness the higher bodies is like a dragon rider who can harness a dragon. 
And this dragon is the shamanic archetype. And the dragon rider is the effectively initiated shamanic individual. How do you learn then? Okay, so fine. Dragon rider. Let's become dragon riders. How do you learn to consciously harness the shamanic archetype? How do you actually become a dragon rider? To do that, you must engage in an intense alchemical process to individuate the shamanic archetype, to really make it your own. And this is where shamanism really dovetails with psychology, especially Jungian psychology. You need to individuate the archetype in order to harness it. This training, or this alchemy, also takes place in isolation, away from society, away from consensus reality. But you should not be totally alone. There is one person you really need with you during this period, and that is the presence of an initiating elder. An initiating elder is precisely who must guide your training and teach you the secrets of harnessing the dragon for shamanic work and also prepare you to face the tests that lay ahead. And believe me, there are tests the serious pitfalls and temptations that you will have to overcome during this period. And with each increment of power that you earn through your initiation, you will be tested on that power. You cannot gain power without being tested on that power to see if you are qualified to keep that power and use it rightly. So the more power you get, the harder the tests are. So that brings us to the third stage of this three-act initiation process. Act three, the return, the ascent from the underworld and the entrance into shamanic service and the return to society for shamanic service. So once you've undergone the initiation proper, you have become fertilized by the divine spark, by the logos, by the divine I am, and have awakened to the conscious experience, conscious experience of the spiritual worlds. And then you've undergone a period of training, a period of alchemy, where you learn how to use these new awakened faculties and a period of testing where you learn how to keep these faculties and, not, and use them rightly then you can begin to return. Now with the new light you've awakened in yourself and the new powers you've earned and you've been tested on, you ascend up and out of the dark and lonely cave with valuable boons in hand to share with your culture. Again, Alex Gray in The Journey of the Wounded Healer. Ascending up now, the shamanic individual ascending up with the caduceus in hand. Or the Promethean who brings the flame from Olympus to share with mankind. These spiritual boons, I like the, the Joseph Campbell's concept of the boon. Spiritual boons that you bring back from the spiritual world can be lost or stolen soul fragments, lost or forgotten wisdom, medicine, music, visions, art, stories, myths, a past, a present, a future, prophecies, sacred history, lost history, higher wisdom from higher realms like, like occult science, prophecies, I said, Guidance for the culture, guiding impulses for the culture, impulses that in general give sustaining and regenerative forces to the culture. So the culmination of initiation is the bringing back of spiritual boons to sustain, heal, and guide the culture. Shamanic service is inherently this karmically redemptive path in the evolution of your soul because you are always transmuting darkness into light, illness and trauma into healing and empowerment, blindness and illusion into true vision and higher truth, the sad song into the healing song, death into renewed life. If you do shamanic service, you're actively working uh, with your own karma in a redemptive way through this service. Service to the culture is the shaman's return, and this completes the initiation process. By surrendering and devoting yourself to shamanic service, you become more and more of a crystallized shamanic individual. You become a light bearer, bearing healing, redemptive, evolutionary impulses from spiritual realms to your culture. So this completes the three stages of the archetypal initiation process. And this three-stage pattern of departure, initiation, return continues to reiterate itself at every stage of shamanic service. It's not just this one-time thing and you're like, okay, now I'm initiated, now I've returned. And then you live out the rest of your life in this return stage. No, every time you dive in to shamanic service, you go through the same fractal pattern. Like uh, you leave the comfort of your own, of your own uh, home to go and help somebody. You're initiated into their psyche. You dive into a soul retrieval and somebody that you're trying to help. Then you return uh, with a boon, with maybe a lost fragment from your patient. And then you return to your home. And that's like one day's work, you know. So each day of shamanic service is a departure, initiation, return. And even within a session where you're working with somebody, there's a departure. Like you, 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 you meet a client, let's say, let's say you're a healer, you meet a client, you, the initial stage is talking to them, figuring out where you're going to do the soul retrieval. 
And then you actually go into a trance and do the soul retrieval. And then you come back with a soul piece. So even in a one hour session, you're doing a departure initiation return. We're talking about a fractal here, a fractal pattern that is present at every stage of shamanic service. So it's not a one-time experience. It's a fractal that reiterates itself over and over again for the rest of the shamanic individual's life. The way of initiation becomes a way of life for the shamanic individual. It's kind of like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. The hero's journey is like a way of life. So this brings us now to the four essential labors of all modern Western shamanic individuals. Shamanism is inherently related to the culture that gives rise to it and to the people of that culture. So we are Westerners. This webinar is given in English language. So this is this knowledge is being shared primarily, although I hope to translate it into other languages, but it's being shared primarily with the English-speaking diaspora of members of Western civilization. And we have our own story, we have our own karma, and we have our, our, our civilization our civilization has its own unique needs. So now I'm going to talk about the four essential labors, like Herculean labors, of all modern Western shamanic individuals. The first, know thyself, know thy destiny. The second, heal thyself and illuminate thy shadows. The third labor is heal and redeem thy ancestral karma. And the fourth labor is heal and work towards regenerating thy culture. It's not like you're going to succeed in fully regenerating thy culture, but it's a labor that you put your you put your shoulder under this labor to work at it, contribute to regenerating thy culture. So the first labor, know thyself, know thy destiny. To truly know thyself is the first labor that you must accomplish or work on at least on the path of modern Western shamanic initiation. This requires your ego to descend into the parts of your soul that are not yet awakened or conscious. This is where all your shamanic potential lies dormant, like a sleeping giant. This is also where all your shadows and unilluminated personal qualities are hiding. So the conscious descent into the unconscious soul is the way in which you can truly come to know thyself. The seed of your higher self is found in the depths of your soul. And you need to fertilize the seed with conscious self-knowledge in order for your higher self to grow and for your higher purpose to unfold. But if you neglect this first task, the unexamined shadows hiding in your unconscious soul will sabotage all your best efforts. And this we get into in part two of this webinar series, The Science of Shamanic Shadow Work. And you will be highly vulnerable to all manner of delusions, inflations, projections, sorceries, deceptions that assail shamanic individuals on this path. Shadow work is essential. And what remains unconscious shadows, what remains unilluminated and unhealed shadows can be used by dark forces to manipulate and control you, a very important consideration in 2022. This brings us to the second essential labor, heal thyself and illuminate thy shadows. Descending into the depths of your soul, you will encounter the result of lifetimes of accumulated karma as we covered earlier on. Damage and fragmentation from trauma, negative character traits, and, and the rotten fruits of the unwise uses of your free will. All this took place in past lifetimes, but it is being recapitulated in this lifetime. But this time around, there is a built-in redemption potential, provided you harness the alchemical magic of shamanic initiation, provided you do the necessary shadow work. So the second essential task is to heal thyself. This means that you're going to need to devote a lot of effort to soul retrieval work, to shadow work, to mending of fragmentations, and even in some cases, deep possession, purifying your astral body, illuminating your shadows, working on the redemption of karma. We will cover this in considerable depth in part two of this webinar series. We will be looking deeply into the mysteries of shadow work, the details of shadow work, the science of shadow work, and the practical, the practice of shadow work, how to actually do it. Doing real shadow work, you will be working earnestly to transmute darkness into light, pain into compassion, trauma into empowerment, illness into health, fear into courage, death into new life. You need to eventually unite all the fragments and oppositions within your soul so that you can become whole and in a state of integrity. When this happens, your soul and ego become receptive and worthy vessels for your higher self to further incarnate and manifest. So shadow work is the direct path to incarnating your higher self. It cannot be bypassed. It is the path through which the higher self incarnates. This is what happens when you do shadow work effectively. That's why I've devoted an entire webinar, a long webinar, to the science of shamanic shadow work. Unhealed traumas and fragmentations in the psyche prevent the higher self from being able to incarnate properly. 
That is why the shadow work of unifying the conscious and the unconscious psyche brings about a progressive manifestation of the higher self. So those who think they can bypass shadow work and go right to their higher self are in for a bad surprise. Actually, they're not even going to be surprised because they probably won't even realize what's happening. So shadow work cannot be bypassed. And moreover, the unhealed traumas and fragmentations in the psyche are precisely how these dark forces can manipulate and control you. They're like hooks that the sorcery can hook onto. These sorceress forces are expert, expert, terrifyingly expert at exploiting traumas, actually triggering traumas, causing traumas, and then exploiting traumas and wounds in order to bring about desired outcomes. Outcomes that can only cause more trauma and woundedness, which further increase the power of the darkness and further decrease our power, make us more uh, easier to control, manipulate, exploit, and capture in soul capture. So if you don't proactively work to heal these traumas and wounds in your psyche, they remain hooks for dark magic. So pay attention to the world you're living in and work earnestly to transform the hooks, these hooks into sources of, transform them from liabilities, from vulnerabilities, into the opposite, into sources of personal power, integrity, and protection against this dark magic. Ultimately, you need to reestablish and strengthen the connection between your soul and the divine source of your soul. The divine source of your soul. You need to hook, you need that anchor to hook your soul to the divine source of your soul. But the healing work doesn't stop with your own individual karma. That's not the shamanic path. The shamanic path always leads to selfless service. Understand you are part of a folk soul and you owe that folk soul a lot. And you share in the collective karma of your folk soul. In this lifetime, at least, you are part of the folk soul of Western civilization. And other folk, sub-folk souls within that. Western civilization is a very broad term. You can be part of a certain ethnicity within Western civilization. You can be part of people that were colonized by Western civilization and have now been appropriated into Western civilization. There's, there's various levels of folk soul, but at the broadest level, you are part of the folk soul of Western civilization. And the folk soul of Western civilization has heavy traumas and a heavy karma. And you have a vitally important role to play in the healing and redemption of this ancestral karma. So that brings us to the third essential labor, heal and redeem thy ancestral karma. The Western folk soul has a complex and badly wounded relationship with its own lineage of shamanic wisdom. Western civilization's shamanic lineages were so badly persecuted by the Church of Rome that they had to go underground in order to avoid complete extermination. This underground shamanic wisdom evolved into what we call Western esotericism which further evolved into secret societies who guarded the secrets and mysteries of the spiritual world and eventually harnessed these mysteries in egotistic ways to amass great power and influence for an elite few. These secret societies fell into corruption and dark magic. So the once persecuted lineage of Western shamanic wisdom became incredibly powerful and then fell, fell deeply into the diabolical temptations of power. And if you want to learn the details about how this went down, check out part three of this webinar series. But there have always been noble souls in the West who have resisted this corruption. I think of like Lord of the Rings, like people like not falling for the temptation of the ring of power. So there have always been noble souls in the West who have resisted this corruption, who have fought valiantly against this abuse of shamanic gnosis. And if you want to learn about them, also check out part three. And these bright lights are our heroic elders whom we should venerate and whose example we should follow. These benevolent and heroic elders are the ones who give us the keys to healing and redeeming the folk soul in general. Because if we can restore and repair our lineage of ancestral shamanic wisdom, we can redeem our ancestors by upholding their noble legacy and carrying it forward so that their sacrifices aren't in vain. But it's not easy. Much healing and redemption is needed. At this point, much healing and redemption is needed. Because in general, our ancestral lineage is tied up on the one hand with the terrible trauma of centuries of genocidal persecution. And on the other hand, with secret societies who have either fallen unwittingly into black magic or else ugh, who fully embrace it in the hellish pursuit of complete world mastery. If this ancestral healing work doesn't take place, the shamanic power of Western civilization will remain in the hands of black chaos magicians or dark chaos magicians, and we will be powerless to stop the nightmare from unfolding 
the dark spell that's being cast. The profound traumas and wounds in our ancestral memory will be used against us in order to create chaos, stoke hatred, and create unreconcilable conflict between groups of people and usher in even totalitarian nightmares, even in freedom-loving nations, even in apparently liberal democratic nations. In order to control the evolution of Western civilization itself and more than Western civilization, in order to control the evolution of humanity itself. And this opens up to bigger questions and more occult concerns about the uh, spiritual evolution of humanity, which again, we get into in part three and which I really dive into uh, within the doors of my school. So those with ears to hear, listen well. So the third essential labor of every Western shamanic individual is to retrieve the ancestral wisdom that was lost through persecution and to purify, illuminate, and redeem the corruption of the occult knowledge that survived the persecutions, but entered into the secret societies in a perverted and inverted and corrupted form. And moreover, to use this shamanic wisdom rightly in order to carry out the most profound sort of healing work on one's ancestral karma, both personal ancestral karma, like your parents, your bloodlines, and also the collective ancestral karma of Western civilization. If this work doesn't take place, Western civilization will fall into terrible darkness, fall further into terrible darkness. If you're paying attention, you can very clearly see this happening right now. So this brings us to the fourth essential labor of all modern Western shamanic individuals, heal and work to regenerate thy culture. If you accomplish these first three essential labors, if you truly if you come to truly know yourself in the deepest possible sense and you heal and illuminate the shadows and karmic imprints on your soul, and further, you work to heal and redeem the shamanic wisdom of your ancestors and the ancestral karma of Western civilization, then you are empowered to bring healing forces, wise guidance, and regenerative impulses to your culture at large, to this Western culture that is currently undergoing a monumental soul loss and catastrophic crisis and is at a real tipping point and is being more, like relentlessly attacked by... Dark magic. So if you do this, you can become these four tasks, or these three tasks lead you to the fourth, where you become a guardian and a healer and a regenerator of the cultural soul, a regenerator, protector and regenerator. And you can play a vital role in the renaissance of the shamanic impulse in the 21st century. You can play a vital role in the only remedy we really have for this global crisis, for this spiritual crisis, for this evolutionary crisis, and the only defense, effective defense we have against the onslaught of dark magic that we are all facing. So far, we've covered the emergence of the shamanic archetype as a healing response to the global crisis we're facing, to the spiritual crisis we're facing, to the evolutionary crisis we're facing the three archetypal stages of shamanic initiation, and the four essential labors that every modern Western shamanic individual must work earnestly to accomplish. So how can you go about accomplishing all this? How can you progress through the three stages of shamanic initiation? How can you accomplish the four essential labors of the modern Western shamanic individual? The answer is, follow the right curriculum within the right community. Carry out your work in accordance with a true science of initiation that is suitable for Westerners in the 21st century. And I'm about to show you a community and a curriculum that can guide you through this very process. I'm about to show you a true science of initiation that is uniquely suited to Westerners in the 21st century. So we're going to move to part three of the webinar now. Act three. The return, healing and harnessing the crisis of the modern shamanic call. Please allow me to present the community and the curriculum I have prepared to help you accomplish all this. Introducing the School of Modern Soul Science. And first I'm going to show you the curriculum. Sorry, first I'm going to show you the community. Uh, so you can see where the curriculum is hosted. You can see the culture of the school. So I'm going to show you the, the community and the culture of the school before I show you the courses. Introducing the Psalms community. Welcome back. So, the School of Modern Soul Science community. This is an online social network 
but <laughs> specializing in the shamanic archetype. This is the school's social network. And so what does everybody in this community have in common? They have in common the shamanic archetype. Everybody in this community is touched one way or another in a unique way by the shamanic archetype. They're Westerners who feel that they're undergoing some sort of, they have some sort of shamanic calling and they're here to discover that and to form community with other Westerners, other people in a kind of soul tribe who are on a similar path. Okay, so here's the discovery page. Here's the four welcome posts. Here's the orientation, start here. Here's the uh, rights, community member rights. Here's a mission statement. Here's a fair warning. There are posts. Here are the top posts. Here's a webinar I've recently posted, the anatomy and consequences of a shadow work bypass. Uh, there are topics of conversation. I'll show you these in a moment. I'm following all the topics. You're going to get really excited when you see these topics because these are very likely all the things that you like to talk about. There are events that are hosted on Zoom. And there are groups, and groups are amazing. I can't wait to show you the groups. There are members, and you can, you know, you know, prowl on members. Like, let's check out this Andrew Camargo guy here. Who's this guy? What's he all about? Well, uh, he's the host of the network. What do you know? His specialty is culture hero light bearer. He's located in the Peru area. Here's my introduction. I am I am here to pioneer a Western shamanic tradition, a Western shamanic science of initiation, and a Western shamanic culture for the 21st century, a 21st century link in the golden chain, and so on. Here are the courses that I'm in. Well, I'm in all the courses because I created them. And here are all the groups that I'm in. I'm in all the groups, and I'm following all the topics, and I'm attending all the events. Uh and so that's just one of the members, but there's members here. And when the, when the, when the, when the program gets bigger, you're going to be able to see where they are. So this opens up the possibility of, if people want to be known where they are, opens up the possibility of in-person meetups and here, uh, top courses, courses. This is after all a school and these are the courses in the school. So you have a feed. Your feed is formed by the topics you're following, the groups you're in, the members you're following. Ooh, that's scary. The figure of the jester, the fool, the trickster archetype has existed in many cultures in many different eras. And, and though that figure has taken many different forms, it's one key is, here's a post on the trickster, uh, praying with images. This is neat. So, you know, like you can like posts, you can comment, share your thoughts, you can respond in threads. Here's a question that I posted. Okay, so this is this is your thread. It's made up of the people you're following, the topics you're following, the groups you're in, the courses you're in, and what you're responding to. And you can uh, you can switch it to list view or feed view, and you can filter it and sort it. You can sort it by what's popular, the distance, your physical location. You can show your personal feed, or you can show everything that's going on in the network. Uh, you can make posts. So here's a quick post. Share what's on your mind. I am excited to be recording this webinar. I am excited to be showing people the Psalms community, which I love this community. And you can tag it under a specific topic. I'll show you topics in a second. You can go live. Well, I can go live. I can do a live stream. I can create a poll. Or I can, you know, post videos, photos, or files. Now, you can do a quick post or you can expand it to an article. An article. Uh... Here's the test. You can share something amazing. Like you can do, uh, I'm holding a microphone in one hand, paragraph, and then you can do a uh, picture or host a video link. You can host links within here or embed files. You can do lists, numbers, divisions. You can tag it under a certain topic. Let's say ancestral lineage, ancestral healing, and you can post it, you know? And so it's like blogs. Uh, you can do blog entries. And uh, when you do that, you can, you know, of course, like it, the functionality, like you can tag people, say, hey, I, I read this and I tagged you, you can tag people. It has the same functionality as Facebook, only there's no ads and um, nobody's buying on you here. Uh, you have, you know, messages, private messages, just like in uh, Bookface here, you can have private conversations with people and you have your notifications, just like Bookface. Uh, and so you can stay up to date and you can customize your notifications. Uh, you can get email updates every day and this has a great mobile app so you can participate in this uh, community on your phone. I turned off cheers on my stuff because I would just get nuts. Comments, everything else is pretty much turned on. Comments, when somebody mentions you, when you comment on something and somebody comments after you so you can stay involved when there's new course materials put up. 
And you can turn on your notifications for all the individual groups that you're in and all the individual courses that you're in. So if the accountability group is getting too nuts, you can just, because people are always, this is a really active group. I love this. is like my favorite group. You can turn that off and on so you can customize your notifications. Okay, let's look at, so you can check out the members, you know, and see people that you have things in common with. Uh, but topics, let's look at topics. These are all the topics of conversation here. Contemporary shamanism, contemporary shamanism, traditional shamanism, entheogens and entheogenic shamanism, ancestral lineage, ancestral healing, Western esotericism, occult history. So you can follow or unfollow these. This will affect your feed. Hermetic arts and sciences, alchemy, astrology, magic, sacred geometry, architecture, occult systems, the divine wisdom of Hermes, Trismegistus, the Hermes Trismegistus of the 21st century, Carl Jung and soul science, Rudolf Steiner and spiritual science, modern mythology and myth-making, pre-modern mythology, visionary art, the golden thread documenting your journey, your alchemical journey, your initiation journey, a creative arts workshop where you post what you're working on, a modern shamanic initiation science where I guess this webinar would be, would be on this topic, shamanic shadow work, the next webinar will be on that topic, sacred ecology and spiritual activism, soul retrieval and healing arts, Eastern wisdom because we're committed to syncretism, Speaking of that, spiritual syncretism, weaving, and evolution, shamanic arts and culture, spiritual warfare in the 21st century. This is an active topic. Because remember, this is like the campus commons. This is what people are talking about, like what affects them on a daily basis. So, you know, there's a lot of talk on this. Prophecy. The truth is out there. This is a serious place for serious conspiracy research. Uh, I teach occult history and, and a, a fundamental fact of occult history. This is not even up for debate. There are secret societies that have always, that have, even for the past 400 years, well, for the past 600 years, have been secret societies. And for the, for the past 400 years, there have been corrupt secret societies and they're still around. So, you know, if you're vehemently opposed to this idea, you probably won't like me very much because, you know, I don't, I don't mince words here. I'm here to teach how things are. And uh, I'm kind of unapologetic about teaching what I know. Mystery archaeology. This is a fascinating topic. This picture right here is about half an hour from my house. This is actually mind-blowing. A community library, a community where we share PDFs of, of amazing books, community dream journal, the topic of community building, permaculture, and food, network gnosis, a, a topic for personal introductions when people come into the community and they introduce themselves. And there is a topic for help, calls for spiritual support. So these are what we talk about. And we don't just talk, we also meet. So events. There's a shamanic uh, journey circle. What is this? Tonight at 7.30. Taurus meditation, share your medicine. Here's the study group that I host every Sunday. And this is my favorite, peer accountability group. And I'll show you this group in a second, but this we meet every Monday morning to uh, help hold each other accountable. These are all on Zoom but you can link to it and keep everything organized here. You, you sign up for the event and then it'll send you reminders and then you can just click and go right to the Zoom room. So events. Now, uh, the members, I will show you the shamanic archetype in a moment, but the shamanic archetype I've broken down into 25 facets and the members of community can like self-identify as a certain facet. So let's say you want to start strike up a conversation with all the astrologers in the community. So you go to Hermetic Mage Alchemist Astrologer and you say, hey, astrologers, what do you think about the current conjunction going on? Or what do you think about, you know, the Mercury retrograde? And, you know, so you can you can fraternize and, and, and uh, you know, and be in community with people who resonate with the same aspects of the shamanic archetype. But this now is what I'm really excited about. Groups. Groups are like microcosms of this entire network. So everything you've just seen in the network, they exist in a kind of fractal form in these groups. These groups are, are, are individual subcultures within the larger culture of the community. So you have the accountability support group. And I love this group. This is so amazing and helpful. And I'll show you in a second. I'm just going to show you the groups. Accountability support group. Shamanic theater for, for movie people. We love movies. We love shamanism. We love to watch shamanic movies together and discuss them afterwards. Here's a private group for, you know, shamanic techniques. Here's I here's a study group that I host, the Rudolf Steiner study group. I love Steiner. Here's a more edgy group, the Aromatic Deception study group. This is studying... This is not for the faint of heart. This is, as it says in the description, unraveling the evil alchemy and sorcery of Ariman. You'll, you'll figure out who that is in, in part three of the webinar series. So we can discern and defend. This is a, a real intense study group about 
Black magic for the purpose of discernment and self-defense. Uh, Luciferic deception study group. This is like, this helps you discern what's new age nonsense from what's real spiritual wisdom. Uh, mystically connected to nature, nature shamans, a mediumship group. This has amazing potential. A shamanic hospital collective. This is for like soul retrieval work. Pioneering what I call shamanic psychiatry. This is a dream of mine for the shamanic archetype to expand and the school to grow into Spanish speaking Latin America. Portuguese and Spanish, a crisis support group. This is a group dedicated for crisis support, entheogenic facilitator network, shamanic practitioners network, Promethean entrepreneur network. I started this group, a mastermind I'm planning to launch, uh, community builders group, a book club, a writer's workshop, a musician's workshop, a visual artist workshop, a myth maker fellowship. I started this. I'm really into this project of creating the myths for the 21st century, a dreamers group, even a singles group, a group for funding students, a group for moderators, even a security team. And there will be more groups that form as more people come in. They say, Andrew, you don't have a group for, um, you know, uh, animal, animal shamanism or like honeybee shamanism. I'm going to start like a honeybee shamanism group. And I said, oh, okay, go for it. If you think, you know, go for it. And then somebody in the community will be the moderator of that and they will uh, pour their passion into it and that group can grow. So through the groups in this community, this community can really grow in an organic way based on the best and brightest light and inspiration and passion that the members of the community bring to the community. So let's have a look at what these groups are like. Like I said, these are, let's look at the accountability support group. It's a microcosm. See how the color is different? This one's kind of a darker red. Uh, there's a feed in the group. The feed is based, again, on the topics you're following. Uh, you can see the members here, and it has topics and events. So the events are pretty simple. Every Monday uh, at 7 a.m. Eastern time, we meet to say, how'd you do this week? Oh, I did good. I, I reached my goals. Okay, what are your goals next week? Next week, I'm going to do this. Okay, you're on the hook. See you next week. You know, now as more and more people come into this group. And this group is, is bound to be the most popular group, actually, I think. Uh, we're going to have to do more than one meeting a week because it's going to take too long otherwise. There's a chat for just this group. Like, hey, accountability buddies, can I need an accountability for to help me finish my assignment for the first course. Who wants to do it? Yes, I'll do it. And then you hook up, you know, and have a, a chat in just this group. But check out the topics. Okay. And you can follow and unfollow the various topics depending on how you want to shape your accountability. So you have your weekly accountability. You can follow and follow community gratitude affirmation. Uh, I'm working with people who are kind of transitioning off Facebook. Uh, and these people, I'm asking them to kind of steal all the good knowledge out of Facebook and repost it here because Facebook is, has all this great stuff on it. And, and it, but it's a leaky vessel. The vessel here is a sealed vessel. So if people steal good, good knowledge, good information, good, good media, good YouTube videos, good memes off Facebook and, and deposit it here. That will really enrich the school and it will stay here. It's not a leaky vessel. So people that want to sign up for that accountability, uh, people that want to get off Facebook altogether, people that have already gotten off Facebook, they've taken a break from social media and now they see this community and they're like, you know what? This is something I'd be willing to reinvest in. Uh, introverts that are learning how to share themselves and be in community on social media. People that uh, are in the first course of the school and then they want to they want to sign up for a challenge. So all of these things, you know, show up on your feed, not just in your group feed here, but in your master feed, you know, like if I'm in this, if I'm in this group and I have, and I'm in this topic within this group, the posts on this topic in this group will show up in my master feed. So there's accountability for all sorts of things, mastering your soul, alchemy, um, battling depression, dealing with darkness and dark spirits, dominating your smartphone dragon if you're addicted to your smartphone, overcoming addictions in general, dropping bad habits, food, diet, exercising your physical body, maintaining a spiritual discipline, impeccability of your word, time management, cleaning your house, literally, like cleaning your room, literally, Product productivity and focus, I could really use this, and help, calls for peer support. These are all the topics you can follow in just this one group. Yeah. So that's one group and you can join that group or you cannot join that group. But let's say that you're really concerned with the black magic. Let's say you've been listening to my uh, presentation here and the parts where I talk about how sorcery operates and you're like, yes, I want to learn more about that. You can join this group. Okay. This group has its own feed. You can do articles that post just to this group and only people in this group will see it. I have a disclaimer, scary stuff. Um, you know, this is, you know, this gets into like, you know, conspiracy research. Uh, this gets a little more political, you know. Um, 
This is something I posted, a very good introduction to secret, the secret societies behind all this. Amazingly synthesized, here's a video, and there's 53 comments on it. You know, it's people are really, uh, you know, it really struck a chord with people. They post things in their, in their feed. So this group is not for you if you do not believe there is a secret society of people that are, you know, trying to run the world. How does this person run? How the world is run. So there's events. Well, actually, there's no events for this group, although as it grows, we could have events. But check out the topics. Uh, churchianity, modern media, sorcery, scientific materialism, end game, transhumanism, secret societies, evil alchemy, corporations, psychopathology, ritual, war and genocide, technology and technocracy, COVID-19 and the vaccine, imperialism, colonialism, problem, reaction, solution, enslavement, cruelty, social engineering, psyops. Uh, well, this is too occult to talk about here. Uh, aromatic aliens, airmen and the Antichrist orchestrating wars, atheism, the all-seeing eye invading clone, strategic traumatization, harnessing viral operations, politics, culture, totalitarianism, and controlled opposition. This is just a group in the school. You know, this is not even the courses. This is just the culture of the school. This is what people, this is what people talk about in the campus commons, okay? So these are groups. And, and, and so there's something for everybody here. You know, I really like movies. I used to want to be a filmmaker. So we can watch movies here. We can watch movies on Zoom. People, people share movies like Hildegard. Amazing. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Amazing. See, these are all like movies with a kind of shamanic theme. Dune. Amazing. Shamanic theme. So anyway, these are the groups. And finally, and this is something I will show you more after I show you the courses, but you know, this is just the culture I've shown you so far. But this is actually just housing the courses. I mean, this is a school. So what I've showed you is like the campus commons, the university culture. But uh, there's actually like classes with the head professor here. So here's the first course, which I'll describe more shortly. And these are all kind of uh, video lessons here. That's me looking all serious. And you can comment on individual lessons if you if this particular lesson and and uh, each course is actually like a group too. You know, you can see who's who's taking the course. You can see the events for the course. There's a study group here for the course, and you can see the topics for the course. And the topics I've broken down into the 25 facets of the shamanic archetype. So you know, and there's a chat. Each one has a chat. Hey guys, I'm working on this uh, mandala. Can any help with this mandala? So that's the courses. So I think this is a pretty good uh, in-depth um, kind of look at, at the school of modern soul science from the inside. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. If you're interested in learning more about the Psalms community, you can click on the link in the comment section that will take you to the registration page for the community. If you're interested in joining the community, it's only $10 a month. You can cancel at any time. Uh, so if you feel called uh, to be a member of this community, check out the registration page just in the link below. And thanks for joining the webinar. If you want to see the other three webinars in the series, it's here on this channel.